All right, good morning. And I'm excited. This is going to be awesome today. Like, we've got some great worship. Matt Hobson's here. Uh, y'all ready to worship? Let's stand up. Let's stand up. I'll pray us in, and uh, we'll give them some time. But yeah, yeah. Everybody wave at me. Let's be here today. <laughs> Good to see y'all. All right, awesome. Well, yeah, Lord, we love you. We, we come to you, Father. We just come and right where you're at. Father God, you've invited us. We're seated in heavenly places. Lord, it's amazing you, the connection that you provided. And we just experience that right now, Lord. We just we turn our affections wholly and to you, Lord. Lord, help us look right into your eyes this morning, Lord. Let us go there. Thank you so much for your presence in this awesome house, Lord, the Father's house, Lord. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing with the hearts in here, Lord. I'm just so excited about so many different things you've got going on right here. I can just look out and see so many awesome things you're doing. Yeah, you're all over the place. You're moving. Yes, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. You're restoring families. You're bringing people together. You're, bringing, uh, you're destroying mental illness. You're, uh, you're doing amazing things in this place, Lord reconciliation, restoration, redemption. You're redeeming things, Lord God. You're providing. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We just worship you, Father. We thank you so much for your presence here. Yeah. Yeah, we worship you, Lord. And David would often say, Selah, and, you know, there's a lot of interpretations of that word, but... Uh, uh, it's basically just what we're doing right now. Take a minute. Push in. Be present. Be totally present. Say la. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Jesus, you are king. You are king. King of kings. Lord of lords. Just exalt him in your heart. Like, you know who he is. Go ahead and just start saying who he is. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. We exalt you above everything, every circumstance, all the difficulty that came at us this week. We, we put you up high, Lord God. You're, you're above it all. You're above it all. You're worthy of everything we've got, Lord. You're just so good at, at being good. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear him just humming in this place? That's not just the air conditioner back there. <laughs> he's, he's just here. He's just humming. He's singing over us, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Where you don't have hope, he has hope. He's like, let me give you anything you're missing. What you're missing, he has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Let's just keep the attitude of worship. We're going to, we've got an a awesome uh, worship music guest. And let's just. Keep our eyes fixed on him. That's what we're doing. That's what we came here to do. We thank you, Father, for everything you provide to help us to do that, to focus. To bring our hearts to the table where you have made sacrifices for us. You spread out a table in front of us. And you say, come and have this feast. Have, have more. Have what you needed. Have what you're missing. Feast on it. Jesus is everything we need. That's what the word says. So it's in there. What you need is in there. Well, amen. Amen. Y'all, this is going to be great.
we have come to give you glory we have come to give you praise sing it again we have come to give you glory come on we've come to give you praise we have come to give you praise oh you're welcome in this place 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 have your way oh have your way have your way This place, you're welcome in 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 this place. Have your way, have your way, have your way, have your way. Come on, give it permission, have your way, have your way. your name Jesus we bless your name 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 We've come, we have come to give you glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just press in. Come on. We have come to give you praise. Come on, come on, yeah. Hey, we have come to give you glory. We have come to give you praise come on you're welcome oh you're welcome in this place 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 have your way have your way have your way Have your way, have your way, have your way. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out, shout out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out, hey, shout out. 
bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out, shout out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out, shout out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out, shout out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out. Come on, we bless your name. Shout out. We bless your name. We bless your name. We bless your name. We've come to honor you, Holy Spirit. We bless your name. We bless your name. We bless your name. All your ways are perfect. You know more than I do. Come and have your way. Mm-hmm. We bless your name, God. We bless your name, God. It's all for you. It's all for you. I didn't come all this way not to make it about you and you alone. I didn't come all this way not to make it about you and you alone. Mm-hmm. I came to find you. I came to find you. the Lord on my soul and let all that's within me shout out, shout out. Bless the Lord on my soul and let all that's within me shout out, shout out. Bless the Lord on my soul and let all that's within me shout out, shout out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout Spin forever in the pleasure I find looking in your eyes. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all. This world, you can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. More than silver. treasure that I hold. I'll spin. Yeah, get tasted of your goodness. Nothing else will satisfy.
Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, you can have all this world, just give me Jesus. Sing it out. I don't need anything else. You are my one thing. You are my one thing. I don't want anyone else. And I don't need anything else. You are my one thing. You are my one thing.
Help me not to forget it. Teach me not to forget it. I want to always remember who you've been to me. I want to always remember who you are to me. Teach me to remember who you say I am to you. Who you say I am to you. Man. Yeah, you can keep playing for a second if you don't mind. Let's let's just let's go deep, deeper, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I was just thinking, gosh, the Lord kind of rolled over me this week with uh, this awesome thing for, I, I don't, you know, I, I hope I can take you guys there and communicate this well, but it was so cool. You know how it says in the Bible and multiple places uh, that David was a man after God's own heart. And I've been really digging into the Psalms and um, just all of a sudden I feel the Lord Gosh, man, he, he just hit me with this. He's like, David wanted so bad to give his heart away. He, he heard that, you know? He heard, he's, he heard that he was, he was a man after God's own heart. And he's like, if I've got that heart, I want every Israelite to have that heart too. And as I was just reading and saturating myself in the heart of David, because he gives it so freely. David's like, I got this. 
and I want to give it away. <laughs> I want everybody to have it. I don't want anybody to miss out on having a heart that's after God. Oh, man, it was everything I needed. It was everything. I mean, it just so lifted my spirits, man. It just made me so strong on the inside. And um, those psalms are there for us. They're there for you and me and everybody here. And, and, um, and I, all these songs we've been singing today, these are all from David's heart, man. He was just saying, like, <laughs> come on, like, I know you're good. I know you're good. I got challenges and stuff, and man, I, but I know, I know you're good. I know you're good. I know you're, I know you're, that was the heart that was after God right there. That was the one. That's the one that all of us have probably experienced at least once or twice in our walk with the Lord and um, probably a lot of times. Let's just engage in that heart right now. You know he's good. You know he's good. Maybe you're going through a lot. And that's what David brought. He brought authenticity to the table with God. He was wanting to be seen. He said, God, go ahead and look at, right at me. Look at my sin. Look at everything I got. Go ahead and look right at me. <laughs> because he didn't want anything coming in between him and God. He didn't want anything to be in between him and, and the Father. You have a heavenly Father. He's right here. He's right here. <laughs> He's with you, man. Wow. You guys have one more? Is that, would that be okay if I asked it from you? That'd be so good. You guys want one more? All right, yeah, I thought so, man. <laughs> put you on the spot a little bit, but thank you so much. Oh, 
Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your presence. Ooh, it's thick in my hair this morning. <laughs> yeah, I just saw as they were singing. Um, I just felt like the Lord was tending to our hearts and he was weeding things out and tending to the soil and planting new new seeds. So he was weeding things out so then he can implant the new things that he's wanting to do in our lives. And then I just saw things flourishing from that. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you what you're doing this morning. God, Jesus. 
thank you for the tending that you do in our hearts, that you care so much for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Yes, Lord, you're so good. Yeah, let's just give the Lord a hand. Let's just praise him. So good. So good, guys. Thank you so much. Yes, give them a hand, too. That was so good. Thank you for bringing for bringing that goodness. Y'all, I'm a puddle of mush over here. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, I don't have too many announcements, just that we have um, after service today, we will have Sunday school for K through fifth, and then um, the Alpha course will be down the, in the um, kitchen area, and then also Power in the Spirit back here. Okay. Awesome. So good. It's good to see everybody. Um, how are y'all doing? We're good? Yeah. Better now. I feel better. I feel a lot cleaner. It's great. Um, Bob, did you have anything? Okay, let me let him give it over to him. Yeah, uh, real quick, I, yeah, I think um, we need to pray for some people this morning. Uh, Colin, um, beloved Colin, uh, is in uh, Indonesia. We want to pray for him. And uh, someone that's uh, come to our, our church a lot and is we consider him part of our family, Bert Beers. Uh, has had a stroke and he is in Spain rehabilitation in Birmingham we want to lift him up and as I was sitting there I wanted to uh, give anybody an opportunity to just speak out a name or a situation and uh, just say it and then we'll cover all that in our prayer time so anybody got any anybody that that needs prayer or you need prayer just speak out the name what Tyler Goldsby's family, Goldsby's family. That's a good one. Destiny. Destiny? Okay. Melvin. Melvin. Got, yeah, old Melvin. Anybody else? Going once. Judy Moore. Their family. Andrew. Going once. Patty McCurdy's mama, father. Anybody else? Miss Ann. We love Miss Ann. She's still the prettiest lady in Selma. Anybody else? You got Ferris. Robert? All right, y'all. Well, we're going to, we'll just, we'll pray right now. Lord, we just bring every concern. And I know there's some in here that are unspoken that, that um, we, we want to, right now in this moment, we're digging the hole through the roof like those friends did for the guy that was paralyzed. And we are bringing, instead of him on a mat, that guy, that paralyzed guy, we're bringing every concern to you. And we're placing them right in your lap. And we just have been singing about your goodness and your faithfulness and just how awesome you are. Lord, we ask you to meet needs, to heal, to comfort, to strengthen, to help people recover. Uh, to be with Colin, protect him, and get him home to us safely. We just love him so much. And, uh, Lord, I, we just thank you for all the good that you're doing even now, that we're like the centurion. We know we don't have to be where those people are, but if you just say the word, Jesus, uh, you'll send legions of angels to go and, and do your bidding. So, Lord, we just bring it all to you and ask you to, to move on their behalf. Thank you for being here with us this morning. And, and Lord, I just, I just think about that song with Corey Asbury. Um, I know there must be more, but I just can't get past your goodness. I know that there's got to be more, but I just can't get past your kindness. You're so kind. Thank you for your kindness. 
It's my favorite attribute of yours right now. <laughs> You're just so kind. We love you, Lord. We just ask that you would increase your, your presence here even now. Amen. I guess that's it. Mattini, you're up. You don't need an introduction. Take it away. Y'all give it up for Matt. That's been pretty good so far. I'll try not to screw it up. I've got a nail or something in my tire, and so this morning I had 16 pounds of air pressure. Do you know how hard it is in Selma to find a place that's got a working tire thing? Um, that's, but the devil's not going to rob my joy. So I got in the car, found an air gauge, gave the devil the middle finger, and here we are. So um, last week was amazing, by the way. If you were not here, I would suggest you go back and watch Bishop Chuck's message. It was incredible. And especially at the end, some of the things he said and some of the things that Josh did during communion, both of those were very impactful. And I kind of want to play a little bit off of that because at the end of the message last week, I made some notes, and one of them was, be careful positioning yourself, because you're already positioned. Your identity is already positioned in Christ, right where you're supposed to be. And so I made a huge note on there, be careful positioning yourself. You're already positioned. And he said, and this is what I want to talk about today, he said, it's a team effort. And I was an MMA fighter, I was a cage fighter for a long time, and I'm not a big team sports guy. Like, I like to be the one, it's either, it's all on me, I mess up, it's my mess up, if I win, I win. I've never been a big team player. But he said something at the end of the message last week, he said, it's a team effort. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It's a team effort. And what I want to talk about today is the aspects of kind of team ministry and how I feel like the church has gotten so far off track where that's concerned. Because what we've done is we've taken this pulpit and taken one guy in most places and put him here and all the responsibility, all the problems, all the burden, all the everything falls on his shoulders. And, and, and in a lot of churches, we'll take this pulpit and we'll become the one that's got all the power, all the control. I'm the only one that can do anything and in a lot of churches. The spectators who are out here will gladly give all that power and authority away because they want to be fed every week and entertained. Just like if you're going to a sporting event. You want to you know, root for your team, and if they win or lose, it could mess your whole week up. Maybe I'm the only one. Have you ever heard somebody say, how was church today? How was worship today? What would you think of worship? What would you think of that Bible study? What would you think of that group? If it's good or bad, it's going to wreck your whole day. It's all falling on them. We went to Pam and Roger's group last week. It was awesome. And so I don't know if you know what they do, but it's literally, you're just going to read the chapter of a Bible, and we're going to talk about what each verse means. It was amazing. So I think this week you're in John 16. So if you're interested in that, it's up here. It was incredible. I don't know about the Alpha course, to be honest, I haven't gone because I already consider myself an Alpha. <laughs> so I don't know what I could learn, but I'm going to try it out today. So maybe we're talking about humility. Um, so we'll try that. So it's downstairs, and our Alpha here is teaching it. So we'll be downstairs, and uh, we'll do that. But I want to talk about the aspects of team ministry and kind of help you, like Bishop Chuck said, find your proper alignment and place on the team. Because we all have a part to play on the team. It can't rest on one people. One of my favorite things about this church is you have no idea who's preaching from Sunday to Sunday. Last week I came in and Rick was leading worship and he said, I didn't know you were preaching today. And I said, I'm not. He said, oh, he didn't even know he was. So I love that because it doesn't rest on one person. And we all have a part to play and we all play a different part. That's why I've got my little friend today. She's going to help me. This is unsaved Sally. Okay, We're going to use her in just a little bit. But Paul talks about team ministry. And if you've been in religious circles, we'll say it's called five-fold ministry. You've probably heard that if you've been in the religious circles or been in church for a while. But Paul has some ideas about that. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says this, which is so encouraging to me. Not everyone is an apostle. <laughs> 
not everyone is a prophet. Not everyone is a teacher. Not everyone can work miracles. And then he goes on to say something that is really what I consider the most impactful thing in that whole chapter. I will show you a much better way. It can all fall on one person. A prophet or an apostle or a teacher or a pastor. And the problem is because of the way we've done that and the way we've done church in the past, we could have somebody up here teaching and leading a church that's not a pastor. You could have a pastor up here preaching, but he's not a teacher. Uh, you could have both of those happening, and they don't have an evangelist. And that's why you see churches kind of stunt in their growth, and then people trying to roam around in chaos, figuring out, what do I do? Where do I serve? What happens now? And, and so you can, if you're in a church long enough, you can kind of start picking out these giftings. Oh, that guy's a teacher. That guy's a pastor. That guy's an evangelist. And then, worse, we start labeling people that way. Because that's what happened to me. I was told, you're an evangelist. I just, all I need you to do is get them saved and then don't, don't worry about it. Go on to do something else. I heard a lot of people doing that. Because I would get somebody saved and they, they wouldn't want to, you know, attach themselves to me. Like, and for me to pastor them. And I'm like, I don't have time to pastor you. I've got to go get other unsafe people. Go find that somewhere else. I've already got three friends. I, I, can't, I, don't, I don't need any more. And that, and that hurt a lot of people. Because I didn't realize that, wow, you could do all of these things. <laughs> And you, could, and you could move in and out of all of these giftings and functions and stuff. The problem, are, are the problem is we don't understand that it's a function, not a title. The minute somebody gets a title, they stop doing everything that they did before. This is an evangelist. Oh, well, that's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to pastor anybody. I'm definitely not going to prophesy or be prophetic, and I'm definitely not going to teach. I'm just going to evangelize. This is my little box. And, we, and we'll put people in those boxes, and they start believing it. And they never get out of it. And God could have something totally opposite for you. But we've labeled them. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, he's talking to Corinth, the church in Corinth. He says, I'm coming to you for the third time and I still refuse to burden you. But what I really want is your hearts, not your money. After all, children should not have to accumulate resources for their parents, but parents do this for their children. As a spiritual father to you, I will gladly spend all that I have and all that I am. Some other translation says, I will spend myself and be completely spent on your behalf. Looking for nothing in return. He says, if you love me more, or if I love you more, will you respond by loving me less? What he's doing is he's encouraging them. It's almost like a father, and that's what we should be doing doesn't matter what this function you're moving in in this fivefold. It should be as a father. <laughs> and it should be with love. And Paul is saying, just like I would if you were my child, I will spend myself not looking for anything in return. All I need you to do is just be who you are. You just be a child. Let me worry about it. I was sharing this story with Holly, my wife, and uh, it made her cry. But it's a great analogy of what Paul's saying. There was a little boy, he was about seven years old. He was eating lunch one day, his mother had fixed him something. He starts writing something down, gets up and leaves the table and leaves a note sitting by his plate. She comes over and looks at it and it says, I mowed the lawn, $2. I dried the dishes, $1. I raked leaves today, $3. I cleaned the garage, $4. You owe me $10. And then he left the note on the table. She didn't say anything, but she went on the rest of the day. When he came in, he went to go get into bed that night, and she had to put a note on his pillow. And she said, bandaged your knee. I love you so much. Cooked all your meals today. I love you so much. Made your socks look just the way you wanted them in your drawers. Love you so much. Made you cookies. I love you so much. And it just went on and on and on and on. And at the bottom it said, you owe me nothing. That's what Paul wants us to understand about ministry. Anything we do should be out of love and for love, not looking for anything in return. There is nothing you need to do for me. And as far as positioning yourself, like Chuck was saying, with God, it's always the right time. <laughs> You're always in the right place. It's always the right time. There's always enough, and there's always more chances. There is nothing that you can do to outrun the love of God. Nothing. So 
Just get that in your head. And as we talk about these gifts and team ministry, understand that if it's not happening with love, then you need to find some other ministry. (laughs) Because if it's not bathed in love, it is not biblical. And when Paul's given these gifts, he does it for a reason. In 1 Corinthians 12, he tells you all about the spiritual gifts and, and what they are and how to move in them. In 1 Corinthians 13 is what? All about love. And then 14 is about order and how you do it. Everything is sandwiched with love. So a good test for you is that if you're in somewhere or you're in a place and you're not experiencing love, then you shouldn't be there. It should be covered in love. And if you're not feeling love, if you're not sensing love, if you're not experiencing love, get out of there. (laughs) Find somewhere else. Find something else to do. And that goes for you too. If you're the person that's not showing love and doing that, it's the same thing. It's a great red flag for you to be like, man, I'm not moving in love right now. Something's going on. I need to do something. i got to check myself. But Paul says, the, and I love that, he says, one of the greatest marks of a true servant, a true apostle, is that he gives himself without restraint to those he's ministering to, holding nothing back. What a contrast from all the false apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and pastors that we know uh, throughout the world. And I'm not bashing churches. But it's a reality, and if we don't address it and speak the truth, we can't change it. So we need to acknowledge, hey, this is a fact. This is where most of the church is right now. How can I play my part and move that in a different direction? Because something has got to change. More pastors are resigning from ministry and full-time ministry than ever before. There's not enough going in that's going out. Like At some point, this is going to have to have a course correction. I, I just read a Barna study that said, Because of the pandemic and where we are now, almost 40% of full-time ministries are shutting down. That's a lot. So if we don't change something, if we don't swing something, then what are we going to do? And I'm not sure it's a bad thing. Maybe I'm one of the ones that doesn't think it's a bad thing. I think maybe God's doing a little bit of that correction himself and shutting down some of the places that we're talking about that's not showing love and not expecting anything in return, and not just after your money, and all of those kind of things. But I want to talk about the biblical concept of a team ministry. And You know, most churches, like I said, have one person that's the main guy. That's a Western mentality of church. Nowhere else in the world does that happen. It's literally a Western mindset of how it is. It's almost as if I'm the main guy, you're the spectators. And, uh, and I hate to use Alabama football as an analogy, but this is a great one because we know we have some Alabama fans. Is anybody an Alabama football fan? Not one roll tide. Uh, there we go. It, we even got the shirt right here. So uh, Alabama football. You, could you imagine if we use the analogy of football with churches that Nick Saban and all the coaches are out there every week teaching these guys, training them, equipping them, doing all the things they're supposed to do. And on Sunday, when you finally get to go to the big Alabama game, the whole team sits on the bench, and the coaches play the game. That's essentially what we're saying about church. We're going to equip you, we're going to teach you, we're going to do all this all week, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every class we have, but then I need you to sit on the bench, and I'll do it because I'm the main guy. I'm the pastor. I'm the teacher, I'm the evangelist, I'm the apostle, I'm the prophet. So I'll let you know when you get to that level and you can minister this way. That's the Western mindset we've created of this team concept. And Paul says that's nonsense. (laughs) You know, I've even heard in the past where people would say, I would be like, are you a pastor? Are you on staff at a church? No, I'm just a lay person. I'm just a lay minister. And I'm like, okay, you know, the word lay minister and clergy is not even in the Bible? Do you know what the word even means? It means I'm untrained and unlearned in every way. Who wants to be a lay minister? That wasn't Jesus' idea of ministry. He actually ascended to heaven and gave us gifts to do this. He didn't want you untrained and unlearned. Look in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 7 through 11. It says, to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he captured captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, what is the meaning of he ascended except that he also descended to the lower regions, namely the earth? He is the very one who descended and the one who ascended above the heavens in order to fill all things. It was him who gave some as apostles, 
some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers. That's the fivefold ministry. But again, these are not titles, these are functions. How do I operate in life? This is how, with these gifts. The aspects of the gifts, the characters of the gifts, not the name of it, not the title of it. I actually saw a car not long ago and the tag on the back said prophet. I don't think they understand what this is saying. But the five aspects of ministry. But we only hear about pastor, which is only mentioned two times in the entire Bible. (laughs) Two times in the entire Bible is the word pastor mentioned, but we put all the pressure and all that on one person. 180 times the words apostles and prophets are mentioned. Something has got to shift a little bit of how we're thinking to do in church. If not, we're going to kind of keep messing this thing up. Uh, An easy way for me to remember it, and maybe to help you, especially as we talk about it here in a second, but if you just hold your hand up, everybody hold your hand up like this. Good job. It's great, great class participation. So the way I like to remember the fivefold ministry, the thumb is the apostle. Why? Because the apostle can touch every other gift. It can organize all the gifts. It can function in all the gifts. It can move in all the gifts. That's the apostle. The pointer finger is the prophet. Why? Because it's always pointing and telling you something. It's calling out something in you. It's telling about something forward. It's pointing in that direction. That's the prophet. The evangelist is the longest finger, so it has the longest reach. So if I'm an evangelist, I can get farther than anybody else. I can get in places that nobody else can. I can say things that nobody else can. I, can, I say stuff up on here that gets a lot of people in trouble, and for some reason I get away with it. But an evangelist can go a little further than everybody else. They can tra- you know, take that line a little bit more to the edge and a little closer. That's the evangelist. The ring finger, that'd be the pastor. That's all about your family, your relationships, your situations. Everything's got to be okay. That's the pastor. And the pinky is the teacher. That's the teacher can get in little small places, pick all them little things out, all the deep thoughts of God, all the deep insights and all the wisdom. And so the, the, the teacher can take those things that nobody else can and make something out of it, teach you what it means on a level that you can understand. So... These are our five concepts of ministry. And when you see a church functioning in it, what you see is the fullness of God come alive. When you see all these different things moving in one place, it just explodes. And, and you know how I know that? Because you don't see it very often. <laughs> and so when you do see it, you're like, what is different here? And then you start seeing it happen. Oh, they've got a guy that's pastoring people. Oh, they've got a guy that's an evangelist. Oh, they've got a, a woman that's a prophet. They've got a, a, and so you can see all these gifts start moving, and it's not one person doing everything. And not one person taking it all on, uh, which creates a, a, a tremendous burnout for everybody. And that's why you don't see the love happening, because they're just burnt out and overwhelmed. I've actually said in my life, I'm too busy to minister. I am too busy to spend time with anybody. That's horrible. I had to make some course corrections. But that's not what he meant for us to do. In Ephesians 4.12, it says, Their calling is to nurture and prepare all the believers to do what? All the work of Blue Jean Church. No. It says to prepare the believers to do their own works of ministry. As they do this, then they will enlarge and build up the whole church. The body of Christ. You were created with a destiny and a plan and a purpose to go do your own works of ministry. If you've never been told that before, that's you. Not me, not Bob, not anybody else you would consider professional church staff. You. You have all authority and all power to go and do it. Well, maybe you're sitting there saying, well, I'm not ordained. I'm not doing this. Put your hand on your head right now. Put your hand right here. You are ordained. Okay? Now go and do what he told you to do. If you have all power and all authority, and he's already equipped you, because Ephesians 1.3 says you have all things, every, everything, every spiritual blessing in the heavens. There's nothing else you can get. So if you're coming here every Sunday or Wednesday or whatever the class you're showing up for, you're trying to to get, there is nothing else you're getting. 
You have it all already. You just need to realize it. And if you realize you've got it all already, now there's a responsibility to do what? Use it. (laughs) Go and do it. So you're commissioned. You're ordained. You're commissioned. Go do it. And then when you come back, bring somebody else with you that needs to hear that. And we'll celebrate that and we'll equip them and ordain them and commission them and they'll go out and they'll do it. And that's how the church grows. Bishop Chuck said, we're preaching to saved congregations in his message last week. (laughs) What a true statement. We're trying to save saved congregations every week. And every week you're wanting this person to give you a new message and you've done nothing with the message that you heard last week. Who was here last week that has applied everything that Bishop Chuck said? (laughs) Mary put her hand down really quick on the last part. She's like, I was here. Nope. (laughs) But it's true. So let's play around with this for a minute. Let me get some volunteers here. Let's see. I need an evangelist. Aaron, why don't you come up here and be my evangelist? Aaron's a pretty good evangelist. You just stand right there on the steps looking good. I got to see Aaron baptized last week in the Alabama River with dogs swimming all around him. All right, I need a, I need a pastor. Let's do Pastor Lee Cummings. Come on up here, sir. And I need a prophet. Let's do, let's do Rick. Come on up here, Rick. I know you want to prophesy today. How appropriate Lee brought his son. Pastor's all about family and community. All right, I need an apostle, so we'll go ahead and take our apostle of the house here. Get Bob up here. And I need a teacher. Let's do, uh, who do I want to do a teacher of? Who are you pointing at? You pointing at yourself? Well, come on up then. That's pretty awesome. It's like I'm volunteering myself. What's your name? Shania. You can just go down there on the end next to the prophet. So the way this works, we got little unsaved Sally here. She's a heathen. No telling what she's been doing. Look, she's got a low top on too. Already judged. (laughs) Definitely not going to a Baptist church. So we got a little unsaved Sally here. Unsaved Sally gets a little too many white claws in this weekend while she's riding on the boat. And, uh, and, and just figure she's done messed up. So a couple white claws, maybe a little eight ball, I don't know, but she's had a great time, okay? So we take little unsafe Sally, and we throw her out in the world, okay? Now a little unsafe Sally's out there doing whatever she wants to do. So the way the five-fold ministry works is you have an evangelist. You need to go get unsafe Sally. Invite her to church. Take her to lunch. Do something. So stand out down there in the front, Aaron. Just throw her over your back. Like, oh, no, just, no, not like that. Oh, hang on, Sally. Hang on, Sally. All right, I got to be more specific. Hold on to her leg and just hang on her back. There you go. There you go. So now just walk a, walk a little bit here in the front, just like that. So, so what's happened is Sally has made a connection with an evangelist. But the evangelist has no idea how to care for Sally. So I'm just going to take her and throw her on my back. I'll do whatever I can. But I really don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. But he's done his job. He's made that connection. He's went and at least made a connection with her. Took her to lunch. Did something. The evangelist has made that happen. So then what happens is we take a pastor. And the pastor goes and says, Hey, Sally, you ain't really being cared for by Aaron. I need to care for you. So put her up on your shoulder, Lee. Hug her. Hug her. Yep. Put her clothes on. (laughs) Hug her, pat her on the back. The pastor is telling her, You're, it's okay. God loves you. He don't care about the eight ball. He don't care about the white claw. It's going to be okay. He loves you. He loves you. And so then what happens is you get a prophet. And the prophet says, you know what, Sally? You can't be hugged and loved on forever by him. So he's pointing at Sally and the, and the prophet saying, there is more than being loved and hugged on. 
You've got a purpose. You've got a plan. You've got a destiny. I need you to do what you're supposed to be doing. I need you back out in the world. Going back to the places where you bought your drugs, where you went. I need you out there. And all of a sudden, she gets fired up. Sally's like, wow, I've got a plan. I've got a purpose. And then somehow she connects with the teacher that says, now that you understand that there's a plan and a purpose there, let me show you why. Let me show you how. Let me teach you these things about God. Let me tell you how you tell that to other people. How do you take your story, your testimony, and turn that around and show it to somebody else? Now the teacher plays a part. Then you get the apostle. The apostle takes Sally and comes over here and gets the whole team together. And that's what the apostle does. What he's doing is saying, hey guys, you're doing a great job. You, thank you for bringing her in, Aaron. Thank you for pastoring her, Lee. Thank you for teaching her this. Thank you for pointing those things out. So here's what we're going to do, guys. We've, we've equipped her already. We've commissioned her. We've ordained her. And we need to send her back out in the world. That's what the apostle does. He's not holding on to it so tight. You can't go anywhere because you're mine now, Sally. Don't go down the church. Don't visit Christ the King. Don't go. Like you, you're part of Blue Jean now. Somebody get her a shirt. Get her a bumper sticker. Like, we want to hold on to Sally so tight. But no, what we're doing, the, what the apostles doing, and what these gifts do, if they're functioning correctly, is what you see is Sally not sitting here every week. What you see is Sally back out there. But you see a different Sally. You don't see the same Sally as you saw before. And somebody notices Sally and says, hey, what's different about you, Sally? What's happened to you? And she says, wow, do you know what? I met this guy named Aaron. Number one, he was a lunatic for Jesus. And, and he started telling me things, but I didn't understand a word he was saying, but he was fired up about it. And it got me fired up. Well, then what happened? He says, well, then I met this guy, Lee, and he actually zipped my shirt back up and told me I didn't have to be that person anymore. And he was loving me right where I was at. Do you know I sat on his porch drinking a white claw talking about Jesus? And it was okay? And then he handed me off to this other person, and he started saying, hey, Sally, there's a purpose and a destiny in you. And she said, something in my heart just came alive. And then I had this woman I met. She volunteers herself for everything. And she told me, hey, here's what you do. Take these things to God and you go tell somebody else. So all I can tell you is that I've been changed. I'm a new creation. And then the next thing you see is it's not just Sally. It's somebody else Sally's bringing back. And it starts going all over again. But then all of a sudden something happens. Take Sally and just throw her that way. Heads up. There you go, Roger. There you go, Roger. So what happens is Sally's out in the world trying to do what she's supposed to do, but all of a sudden she gets beat up because you run into that person that says, hey, weren't you that girl that had her top down, drinking the white claw, doing the eight ball, like, and you're out here telling people about Jesus? There, there is no worth in you. There is no value in you. You can't be part of this church thing. You need to stay on your porch doing what you've been doing your whole life. You're never going to amount to anything. And Sally starts believing that nonsense. And it paralyzes her. And the problem where we're at today is that most of us that are not up here on the stage are that Sally. We've been paralyzed listening to the lies of what everyone has told us our entire lives. And we've not changed one thing, even though we had a real encounter. So the way the fivefold works is it doesn't just abandon Sally. What happens is the pastor hears about it, and the pastor goes to the house where he knows Sally's at. He don't wait for Sally to come to the church. He goes to Sally, and he says, Sally, do you remember when I met you? Do you remember having a white claw on my porch? Do you remember me zipping your shirt up? He said, I need to remind you, there is nothing you can do to separate you from the love of God. And all of a sudden, Sally starts believing it again. And things start changing. And then all of a sudden, she starts getting a little bit excited. Hey, God might really love me. Maybe I haven't really messed up. And then he gives her back to Rick. And the prophet says, hey, do I need to remind you? You've got a plan and a purpose and a destiny and a path to go do what I've already called you to do. And then what happens is the teacher gets a hold of Sally. And she says, what happened? And she says, I messed up. 
well, how did you mess up? Well, I started hanging back around with this old crowd. They started telling me the same old lies, and I started believing them. And the teacher is not saying, well, let me tell you what it says right here in Revelation, because if you, if you do this, you, if you, you, you know, you could do this. And No, what the teacher says is, let me show you how to live life out there as a Christian. How do I live out there like Jesus? She's not teaching her revelation, and I'm not saying that Scripture doesn't play a part in it. But you're not taking Sally, who's just been beat to death out here, and beating her to death in here with the Word. What you're doing is taking her and saying, let me show you how to live this life. So Sally now, the apostle comes back. We all have a communication happening here between all the gifts and functions that's happening in the church. Who's got the best relationship with Sally? Who? All of them, exactly. So what happens is somebody, whoever it is that has time that day, so we'll say the evangelist does. All right, Sally, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go with you today. I'm going to spend the day with you. I want to see what you do, where you go, how you live, and I'm just going to live life with you. I'm just going to spend time with you. I'm not preaching to you. It's not on a Sunday. I'm not trying to change you. I'm just helping you live life and understand how this works. And if you get messed up again, here's what you do. Don't stay hid over there behind Roger's house. What you do is come back and find one of us. Because we love you. There's nothing you can do that would cause us to love you less. And Sally starts believing that. And the next thing you know, Sally goes over here and says, Hey, come with me. No, I can't come with you. I've been drinking all day. Come with me. No, I can't come with you. I've been smoking weed all day. Come with you. No, I can't go to church today. I'm, I'm not cleaned up. I'm not right. It doesn't matter. He loves you. He loves you. And she's like, you come with me. You come with me. She's like, hang on. Let me see. No, you don't need air. It's this guy. Lee, Lee, Lee. Give this guy a hug. Love this guy. Love this guy right here. And, th and then that starts happening over and over and over. Thank you, guys. Y'all can sit down. That starts happening over and over and over. That's how the team ministry of fivefold gifts work. Why are we not seeing that? Why are we not doing that? You know how I many Sally's are out there? I was driving around yesterday. If we wouldn't have had to meet Davey, I was telling Holly and them, I'm like, I want to go sit with those three guys on the milk cartons right there because I bet they got a good story. <laughs> Stop beating yourself up for your past. There's not a ton of good stories that started with I was at church on Sunday. Most of the good stories start with I was drinking a few white claws on the river and the next thing I know, I'm... but you can't stay there. God's not judging anything that you've done. He just loves you so much that he's not going to let you sit in that because he knows there's a purpose and a place and a destiny for you. He wants you on the team. He wants you doing your part. Because there's things about Sally that you can help that we can't help. There's things about Sally that you could do that I can't do. And if we're not all doing it together, then we got little Sally's running around all over Selma. <laughs> Believing the lies of the enemy or the lies of their family or the lies of whoever. The lies from themselves. That they're not good enough to be part of God's kingdom. And it's just nonsense. This is Jesus' ministry. <laughs> he chose 12 people, spent just a little bit of time with them and said, okay, go do it. And they went out and created a mess. <laughs> they came back, they're like, nothing's happening. We can't heal anybody. We can't do anything. The demon's not listening. Nothing's happening. Well, he doesn't say, well, you're just not the right guys for the job. No. He, he cleans them up, just like we were talking about in this analogy. And then he takes 70 more and sends them out with them. Y'all go see what kind of trouble you can get in. Take 70 more with you. Then they come back and say, oh my God, even the demons are listening to us. What changed? They were accepted. <laughs> they were loved. They were called out. They were, it, that's his ministry. It's that ministry. It's that model of ministry we've got to have. And when I say in church, I don't mean in this building. When I say we've got to have that ministry in church, I mean your church, your sphere of influence, where you work every day, where you live. You come here for maybe an hour, hour and a half, one day a week. 
I'm talking about where is your ministry? <laughs> That's where you need to be doing this. Because if you're doing it there, it'll take care of itself in here. It'll naturally come here. It'll naturally attract itself to Jesus. That's why the Moses model of ministry was so important. Moses knew he couldn't do it on his own. Well, actually, he didn't know it. His family had to come and say, hey, you can't do this on your own. You're going to burn out. And they started separating groups and people and doing different things. And not, it just didn't fall on one person. Everybody. A team mentality. <laughs> We're all called to function in that. In Revelations 1, 5 through 6, it says this. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, the ruler over kings of the earth, to the one who loves us and has set us free from sins at the cost of his own blood, has appointed us as a kingdom of priests, serving God and Father. To him be the glory and the power forever. You are kings and priests already. It's not that you've got to earn it. It's not that you're going to get to it one day. Already you're a king and a priest. Just start acting like it. A king doesn't act like a peasant. A king doesn't act like a beggar. Act like it. Act like a son. Act like a daughter of, of a father that's got unlimited resources, unlimited chances, unlimited provision, unlimited everything. That's who we are. We're sons, we're daughters, we're priests. That's who we're supposed to be. Well, you just don't know how broken I've been. <laughs> you just don't know my brokenness. You don't know my pain. Well, you, you know when it says that the gifts are given to equip people for the works of their ministry? That word equip means broken. To be equipped is to break something. It actually, the, the actual word of it is to reset a broken bone. So if you've ever had a broken bone and had to have it reset, that's what it means to be equipped. So if you're broken, you're in the right place. You're, you're already prepared to be equipped. Your brokenness is what qualifies you. And I know we've got a lot of our Teen Challenge crew here today, and I don't know the rest of the crowd. It seems like a little larger than normal, but it doesn't seem, I don't know where everybody's from, but I can tell you this, and I want to prophesy this over our guys today, and, and whoever else here needs to hear this. But your brokenness, your brokenness is about to exalt you. <laughs> it's about to elevate you. And how do I know that? Because Jesus says that those that have been forgiven much, love much. And those that have been last are soon going to be first. In churches that, that have different nights, hey, you can only come, you know, we'll put you in a celebrate recovery on a different night. You sit in a different section. You come here to this meeting. You do this. All that's about to change because this is our ministry. The people that you see in those groups that are broken, those are who's going to be leading this thing. It's not the religious people. And it's not the ones that's got it all right. And just because they're in a, a program or you're in Celebrate Recovery or you've got some kind of hurt, habit, or hang-up, the only difference in them and us is they're better at being transparent about it. We just hide ours. We just hide ours and we clothe it with a little religious talk and a little religious jargon and a little nice clothes and we act like everything's all right. Why, inside we're as broken as they are. And so you guys are about to have a different life. It's going to be a different life. you imagine going in churches? Because I know in your program you get to visit different churches. Could you imagine in churches where it's not, hey, you, uh, I've been in these churches. We need you to set up in the balcony where you guys today. Because they're going to be up and down a lot. They're going to be smoking. They're going to be doing this. So we need you to be up here in this. Could you imagine when you walk into a church and somebody says, oh, you're in a program? Let me take you right here in the front. I need you on the front row. That's what God's saying to us. Your brokenness is what qualifies you to do this. So are you broken today? Anybody? Has anybody in here been broken? A few of us. That's the qualified. So I almost want to make everybody put their hands back up so that the broken can look at the others so they can come and take you to lunch and tell you how broken you are. <laughs> but that's how this thing all works. That's how it's all going to work. So we're going to do a little, a little differently today with our communion. If we can start handing that out. Davey, you guys come back up for me. 
Because you're already kings and priests. You don't need me doing this thing for you. Play anything you would like. What's it going to be like when people really understand the way this thing all works? <laughs> when we really start loving the Sallies like we're supposed to be loving them. And what's crazier is what's going to happen when we start believing those things about ourselves that we're called that we've got a purpose, that we've got a destiny, that I'm a king, that I'm a priest, that I'm a son, that I'm a daughter, that I have unlimited resources. What's going to happen when that comes alive in all of us? You know, there was a study once that said only 10% of churchgoers understand their calling or their gift. Only 10%. Now, the church, even though I'm pretty harsh on it at times, the church has done some incredible things. So think about all the incredible things over the years that churches have done with only 10% of the body actually functioning. What happens if it becomes 40%, 60%, 80%? What could happen? Those things that we read about in other places could start actually happening on a day-to-day -day basis. He was talking about Colin. Colin sending us updates and messages. Colin sent us a message on WhatsApp. He's like, I prayed for a bunch of people after a youth conference, and I was laying my hands on them, and they were starting to fall out, like, and I was afraid she was going to fall on a glass table. He was so fired up that people are responding like that to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he knows he's called, and he knows he's got a purpose, and he knows he's got a destiny. He's out there functioning in it, in the world, doing those things. So since you're all kings and priests, here's what we're going to do. Everybody stand up once you get your communion. Yes, ma'am. Baby, there's yours. Bree can open it for you. So I want you to go ahead and take your communion. You open it up your little wafer there that's the body of Jesus, and then open the top so you're ready to go. But here's what we're going to do as kings and priests today. Because you already have all power and all authority. You're going to lead each other in communion. So I want you to turn to your neighbor. One of you do the body. One of you do the blood. And listen, don't get all religious on me now in front of people. I want you to communicate what you think the body of Jesus broken means to you. I want you to communicate what you think His blood for forgiveness of our sins means to you. Just use your own words. Go ahead, go ahead back and forth. Once you finish your communion, I want you to ask your neighbor, now what can I really pray for you about? Not some unspoken prayer request. What can I really pray for you about? I love you, Lord. 
Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see of the goodness of God all my life. Because all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God. Because yeah. all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing the goodness of God. Come on, your goodness is running, running. Yeah. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Come on, your goodness. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Oh, your goodness is running after, is running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Hello. So that's our prayer. That song is our prayer today. So I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm not going to ask you to bow your head. I want it as public as you can be. But in your own mind, in your own heart, in your own soul, your will and emotions, if you have found yourself in any of the spots that Sally's been in, that song's crying out to your heart today. His goodness is running after you. And so, Lord, I just thank you. And that's your prayer. If that was you today, just in your own heart, out loud, silently, do whatever you want to do. But, it, but in your own way, in your spirit, just say, God, thank you for your love. <laughs> Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for bringing people in my life that came and rescued me out of those places. Thank you for teaching me and equipping me and calling me. Thank you that I'm a king and a priest and a son and a daughter and that you want to be my friend. And I just receive that. I just receive it as much as you can today because <laughs> it'll change. Maybe next week you'll receive a little more. Just receive what he has for you today. We just thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you that it's a team effort. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, I'm going to the Alpha course if anybody wants to go. <laughs> That was awesome. Great job. That was so good. What a great illustration. Uh, anybody needing prayer, you know, we, we'll strap it on for you down here. We'd love to pray for anybody uh, after the service, and uh, let's close with prayer. 
And for all the visitors, I know we have a, a lot of visitors here. We're so glad y'all came. It's so <laughs> We're so honored that y'all would be here and spend worship with us. Come back. We'd, we'd love to have you. You're well, you belong here. You're welcome here. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Lord, we just love you this morning. <laughs> uh, you're just so good. And you're so faithful, and you're just so kind. I just can't get over your kindness. I want to thank you. Thank you for uh, being with us this morning and for encouraging us and giving us hope and, and passion and uh, vision and um, washing us clean. We leave clean by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> it feels good. Feels really good. Now, Lord, as we leave, I feel as fresh with the fire of your Holy Spirit that we would be salt and light wherever we go, and that your blessing and f favor would rest on everyone here. And Lord, just know that this family, this group of people, love you. We love you back, and uh, we pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Awesome.